Well, thanks for taking the time to talk to me, Yohei. Yeah, for sure. Um, who are you? Who am I? Um, well, that's a tough question. Um, I'm a paddler uh, out here uh, on the West Coast. I guess I've been a lot of places, cross paths with a lot of people in the paddling community. Um, right now, I'd say I'm just a just an OC1 paddler who does some other kinds of paddling as well. Um, I was just trying to compete a little and then build up my skills in different craft. What other kinds of craft have you been branching out to? Um, so this season I picked up surf ski. Um, I've been doing that a bunch this past month. And then I've been trying to pick up like high kneel, uh, sprint canoe. Um, I did a little of that, like back in high school, uh, or just after high school, I'm trying to pick it up now and it's really hard. So I wouldn't call myself a C1 paddler yet, but I'm, I'm trying to get there. You're a C1 paddler in progress. Yeah, I, I will be. Yeah, cool. So can you talk about how you started paddling? Yeah, so um, I started uh, in high school, which I guess is like, that's a while ago now, uh, like 12, 13 years ago. Um, my high school really had like a really strong dragon boat program. Um, it has for... I think upwards of 30 years now, um, one of the first uh, programs in North America. And so, you know, I wasn't very good uh, with my hand-eye coordination, but I was pretty athletic. So that was kind of the option for me. Uh, and from there, um, a lot of people on the team uh, did either OC1 or like sprint kayak. Um, one guy did sprint canoe and so I got into the OC one and then that was really fun and after I started the OC one I just like didn't stop for the next, last uh, like 13 years. Cool and your high school is not in the United States we're correct? Yeah so I'm from Vancouver um, my high school's uh, Eric Hamber in um, Vancouver British Columbia. Cool so coming out of like your high school's program was it was it a very competitive high school crew um yeah yeah um depending on the season somewhere uh one two or three in terms of the top three programs in the country wow that's pretty cool yeah so it was definitely yeah very competitive program um very competitive people on that crew yeah, and then kind of of the people from your high school, it kind of seems like there's a good pathway for people from your high school to then branch out into one man canoes of some sort. Um, so out of people that like have graduated from your high school, how many of those people are still paddling or competing? So like right now, I mean, it's harder to, for me to keep track of exactly who's you know still paddling right now. Um, some people from like years below me, like, yeah, people who are younger than me who were in the program after me. I know that those people, you know, are running paddle sport companies in Vancouver. They're coaching top teams in Vancouver or like, um, there's a bunch of them, I think on like the two kind of top teams in Vancouver right now, um, the top like adult teams. So uh, a lot of people um, continue on that kind of in more of the generation of let's say five six years ago you know um maybe a lot of people in the dragon boat community have heard of a team one west like a real big part of the core of that team kind of progressed directly from that high school program so it was kind of really an amazing uh, pipeway into the sport yeah it's into so, the sport. yeah it seems like it was a really good pathway and like to to get people passionate about paddling yeah for cool yeah I think we had just a level of access to the sport not just dragon boat but like the other like individual disciplines that you don't necessarily see at a lot of like high school programs in North America yeah it seems like exclusive to Vancouver and that whole situation and and is it like the area where the 
the Dragon Boat Festival is? Yeah, so where we, at least at the time, trained out of, uh, it's a little different, but it's pretty close by. I mean, it's closer together than any two outrigger clubs are in like any city in the US. But yeah, I think what was really important with that, um, that access is like, you know, it was a 20 minute bus ride from the door of our high school to basically the dock of the boathouse. Um, and it was, you know, like the dues for the membership were affordable for everyone. We had access with those dues to, you know, like 20 OC1s, you know, K1s from beginner level to race level, C1s, beginner level to race level, C2s, C4s, K1s, K2s, K4s, all that. Um, you know, there's a fair time commitment to getting into those sports, but, you know, it was all just it, the level of effort that it took to decide you want to try these things out was just very low. Um, yeah, it was like people would skip class to go paddle and like that was doable. Like you could skip class to go paddle and like probably make it home before your parents found out. <laughs> That's pretty cool. I wish I could have skipped class in high school to go paddle. I totally would have done that. Yeah. I mostly had free blocks when I went during the day, but you know. Oh, okay. All right. Well, that's, that's what we'll publish the information yeah. <laughs> um, to the world. <laughs> we won't tell your parents. Um, that sounds really awesome though. Cause that kind of sounds like my high school where, but with, with rowing, like yeah. It was a 20 minute drive from my high school down to Boathouse Row um, yeah. where the crew members would then, you know, go practice. But, you know, we had nothing like that for my youth team. And then like, even the sense I get out like in California is like you, like the high school teams have access to dragon boats, but not necessarily outrigger canoes, which yeah, key to progressing in the sport. Yeah, it's, it's very much that they, you know, they have access to the dragon boats and they don't even ha necessarily have access that often. And, you know, they might need to like carpool like pretty far to get there. I mean, I don't actually know how the kids get there. Maybe some of them like bus. I know like one of the high schools is pretty close to the lake where they have the practices, but just like that access, it really varies. Um, we've tried some things in like the Bay Area to try to expand that but I think what's great about um how we were set up in Vancouver um and also actually actually set up at Dragon Zone like the festival site that way as well um how it's actually set up in a lot of these rowing programs and a lot of like sprint canoe kayak programs is like this model where the club where the boathouse itself owns like a very large number of club boats of like differing levels and that's all included in your membership I think that that's like really important for growing the sport. Um, that's not something that we've been able to achieve in the Bay Area. We've made kind of small attempts at it, but it's it's not on the same level. Yeah. I think it would be so interesting if Dragon Boat got the same hype as rowing, let's say, because there are a lot of high school, club, after school yeah. rowing programs, but there's just not as much hype around yeah. Dragon boat, which I guess makes sense because like you can't get a dragon boat scholarship to college, but you can get a rowing scholarship or a crew scholarship. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's partly true. I don't know if that's the only part of it. Like for me, actually, I think before I started Dragon Boat, what I really wanted to do was rowing. Like back in high school, I wanted to row, um, but it was since I didn't go to a fancy private school. Um, there's like only a few. I think there might only be one high school or maybe two high schools in Vancouver, which have rowing programs. There was no access to that for me. Um, I mean, after I did a few years of rowing in college, I later learned that it's for the best since I'm a little too short for rowing. Uh, but I think, you know, it's, it's not just whether or not there's money in it. I think it's just whether the community has built that access into like their priorities. Yeah, because I guess like Philly's an example, they've built rowing in as a priority. Yeah. Versus Vancouver, which is built in paddling as a priority. Yeah. Can we switch? Like, <laughs> yeah. 
It's hard sharing the river with rowers. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, rowers yeah. can't steer. Um, it's not necessarily their fault, but it's they hard. They can't hear and they can't see and then they blame you, whatever. <laughs> it's our faults, sure. <laughs> um, so what would you say has been your favorite paddling moment? And this can be something that was like at a practice or a particular race or just something that happened with another paddler, or like a trip you took. Um, oh, there's been a lot of cool things uh, in all the years I've paddled. I think kind of the most memorable, wild, extreme thing I've ever done in paddling. Um, and probably like a number of things on the list all come from the mind of this basically absolute genius paddler coach steersman who I had the honor of being my coach um, for a number of years uh, in Santa Cruz. One thing he organized one year was this paddle from Half Moon Bay to Monterey. And so I think a lot of the listeners aren't quite familiar with the uh, geography of Northern California, but that's 90 miles of coastline which is directly exposed to the pacific ocean um and so we did that uh it was like a change crew um in an unlimited oc6 but you know it was still like a 14 hour journey um we started that i think it was 1 or 2 a.m and it was you know it was just a journey it was a true journey you know extremely long, extremely cold. Some of us were borderline hypothermic um, during it. We started in the middle of the night. It was the right time of year um, for the first few hours. We're kind of sleep deprived and delirious. And then we just hit kind of, I guess, like the marine preserves. And, you know, those are so biodiverse. And one of the things they have is the bioluminescent plankton. So we're already a little woozy we're paddling and every time we put that paddle in the water glows around our paddle it glows around our boat and it was that was just fantastic so that whole journey you know later we hit a storm and then finally making it to the other beach and kind of collapsing just the whole thing was probably one of the most memorable things i've ever done that's really cool with the like the all the nature you get to see along the way especially in the ocean yeah, that's like just all of the interactions you have with nature, like both with the ocean itself and uh, with whatever like sea life you see out there. That's one of the things that I think really keeps me in paddling these days. Yeah, at least you you all out in California have cool things to see. <laughs> I mean, we, we have birds and stuff and cranes, but and bald eagles, but it's nothing like a sea otter. Or yeah, yeah. A little bit of plankton. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think uh, in New York you have better you have better storms. I don't know if people enjoy yeah. them. I think I enjoyed them, but you have better storms than we do, like thunderstorms. Oh, but the 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 Hudson gets very fun in the storms. That's true. Like that one time that we went out, like right before a storm. Yeah, yeah. The thing is, though, I don't think people tend to go out when it's like that. Yeah. It was literally just that one time because you were like, yeah, I'll take you. We can go. I was like, okay, but like, would I go do it on my own? Like, maybe not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I guess I'm just saying, you know, a lot of what you can learn to appreciate through paddling too is, you know, there's a beauty in all of the weather conditions you encounter. You have to treat them with respect and safety, but, you know, the waves and the wind never going to be the same. And it's kind of glorious to watch them. Yeah, and your uh, stern paddler might get thrown off the back and you might not notice. Yeah, yeah, the story is we went out uh, in, I guess, the very beginning of a storm. Some of the bigger conditions we've seen on the Hudson. In OC2, um, I fell out the back of the OC2 and Katie did not notice for like, I want to say like 30 seconds, which is a long time to drag someone by the leash. Yeah, and good thing you were wearing the leash. Yeah. <laughs> good times, though. It was all good. You recovered. And it was hard to surf, though, because someone shaved the rudder down on that boat yeah. for some reason. So steering was challenging. Yeah. Yeah, but good times. I think that's the biggest I've ever seen the Hudson. Yeah, it's it. 
think I think there have been bigger times, but they were very questionable whether you yeah. should go out in them. Yeah, I just don't know if I want to sacrifice my, my boat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm a very big believer um, in, you know, all the safety precautions. Yeah. Why or would you say that you're passionate about paddling? And if so, why paddling and not other sports or other pursuits? Um, I would definitely say yes. Um, I think other than, you know, it's just been the sport that I've done for a very long time and that I've ended up being um, somewhat good at. It's, it's that element that I was talking about before, just, you know, it's a, it's a sport, which is like an individual endurance sport, but like, unlike something like, you know, like running on a track or even like going for a bike ride, I think it's like a very close and raw connection with nature that is hard to get otherwise especially not like in kind of a sport form maybe there's like other sports you know like surfing um like parasailing like those kinds of things which are even you know more raw connections to nature but I think paddling is kind of the good balance between not being insanely unsafe and uh also being really able to interact with the power of nature and the world around you there is like oc1 surfing that we do do here in santa cruz but i broke my rudder recently so i'm taking a break from that oh yeah what happened there um i just wasn't able to get off the wave before it broke uh, oh, okay so then the wave broke did you like spin out and holy and then it broke or um well it was actually a whole thing um i I got a really great wave I think I was on it for like a minute straight like no paddling going real fast for a minute didn't quite get off before it started to break at that point it's really hard to steer and get off I wiped out that's not actually what broke my boat it was me thinking that I was good enough versus how like good the ocean is how powerful the ocean is that I could just relaunch and paddle back and it was in the process of relaunching that I got my boat just launched out of my hands, um, landed on the rudder. I had to do a sad walk back to my car, which was like two miles away, <laughs> get my car, pick up my boat, replace my rudder. Good fun though. Half of everyone I know in Santa Cruz has broken either their rudder or their boat. Oof. Where do you do your surfing in Santa Cruz? Um, so it's, like there's like an area like a famous surfing area um in santa cruz called steamer lane um a lot of like pretty good surfers surf there you can grab the outside of those waves um so like the part that doesn't really curl over and break and ride those all the way down to base like basically from that surf spot to another surf spot called cowls and you just get uh, off before the wave gets too close to the beach and the times when we don't is the times we get in trouble Gotcha. Yeah, I wish we had stuff like that out here. We only have like really tiny breakers and I that happened to me once and I was very lucky that I didn't uh, break my boat because I was going in and I flipped like on the side, like toward the yeah. shore. Yeah. Oh, oh well. Yep. Um, has paddling changed your life and how does it influence other parts of your life? I think yes. Um, I think really probably the big change all kind of came around when I started paddling. Um, you know, that was towards the end of high school. And, you know, that's, that's kind of when you're trying to figure out like who you are, what you want to do in life when you're applying to like all these universities, hoping you get in all this stuff. And I think um, what paddling was, was First, it was like a real confidence builder, um, like doing well at a sport, being in a supportive team environment. And then also just one of the reasons why, you know, when I've tried to do things in the paddling community, I've kind of focused on making the individual aspect um, of the sport more competitive. I mean, that seems very self-centered, but I think it's an important thing for people coming up because I think paddling's also been very important for me in terms of like also building a sense of ambition like 
not just like I can set these high goals, like I can achieve them, or at least I should at least try to achieve them. And I think that's something that really wasn't there for me before, like I joined this really competitive paddling program. So I think that like early impact um, of just being in a competitive paddling program and doing well in it when I was like near the end of high school, really kind of shaped who I've been since then just in all like other aspects of my life. Yeah, it's so interesting you mention like your focus on bettering like the individual in the sport because yeah, it is like a there is a large team aspect to it like especially like with dragon boating and outrigger canoe and there's like that whole community aspect to it. Yeah. And I feel like a lot of times people who are either coaching or really investing into the sport go like the team route yeah that has its own challenges for sure yeah Um, and that can be like really discouraging to someone who's like really motivated and like to develop the sport Mm -hmm. um but yeah going down like the individual route that is definitely I think a really strong alternative that I think complements all the team stuff really well yeah I think you know what's fun about like paddling what's fun even about like rowing is you know it's in a sense it's not truly a pure team sport in the way like you know like soccer is a team sport um in that it's you're in this environment where you're competing as well with the people who are on your team um and at exactly the same role that they're in, like on the team. And that like, you know, trying to beat this person every day, um, trying to beat like everyone else on the team or like a few people who you train with on the team, like every single day you're out on the water, you know, that seems very antagonistic, but like on like a very competitive program, that's like, that is the teamwork. That is like the, the connection and support it's like your support is trying to beat this person and them trying to beat you so I think if you can frame that in a positive way that like ultra competitiveness can be supportive yeah that's a really good way to think about it um you've been talking a little bit about like throughout our time talking together about your high school program and being competitive toward the end was the 2009 Prague Worlds, was that towards the end of your, the time in your high school program? Yeah, so I wasn't actually on my high school program for that long. I joined pretty late, like halfway through 11th grade, basically. I wasn't very good in 11th grade, um, but you know, it was the experience of not being very good in 11th grade that made me kind of want to come back the next year and do a lot better. And so that was kind of like a whirlwind year. I was like, in September, I decided, okay, this year I'm going to be good. So like, I asked all the like, um, more veteran paddles on the team, like, what do you guys do? Picked up OC1 and just like, and just went for it. And then it was just in that first, like five, six months of being competitive that like, I forget quite how it happened, but people kind of like scouted our school for that prog team. And then, you know, my first taste of being good at something, the next taste was okay. Um, Even though some of you are less experienced, everyone's going to try out for this program. And then some of us made it. And then, you know, I've been paddling for like a little over 12 months, basically. And then suddenly I'm like, since there's no other coaches in the area, they throw like six of us in the boat with like false Creek high performance, which is like the boat that that year, like, actually won worlds for like the premier division and so we're like sitting on those boats like as pretty fresh paddlers and then we end up um we fly out to toronto we see a totally different world of paddling we try to learn to paddle like them and then like a week later we're in Prague. so in terms of paddling that was like a crazy year yeah it's i think so you were on U18 that year, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I was U16, but we were racing in the U18 category. Mm-hmm. So we must have raced each other. Yeah, we oh. definitely raced each other. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty funny. And like, I don't think like, we interacted with 
and E of U, which is a bit sad. Yeah, well, there was like some animosity with like the U the Canadian U sixteens mm-hmm. and the United States U sixteens. Mm-hmm. There's like a whole story behind that, but okay. not not for right now. <laughs> um, but this was, must have been back when like the way I guess like the U.S. no. Well, yeah, I guess for like the youth teams, the way the USDBF was doing it was that like whatever youth team won nationals in 2008 got to be like the core of the U16 and U18 team the following Mm -hmm. cycle. So it kind of sounds like that's the way it was. Yeah. So I think in Canada, this was an interesting year too, because it was the year where uh, both the like U18 and the um, premier program started to transition away from that same model. So like False Creek in premier won nationals um, and they basically, so like they got the right to make um, the premier team, but they decided to take the step of pulling in um, a bunch of people. I, so I don't, really know the team that well from that year but i think think they basically pulled in like the top guys off like the outer harbor predators which were like the other top team who they'd narrowly beaten and then um it was kind of a similar situation before 2011 i think eric amber actually never went to nationals and so they eric amber never had that bid but pickering who i think is the team who won nationals that year they got the right to send two boats, U18 and U16. And I think basically they thought, you know, let's try to beef up these boats. We're not required to, but we're allowed to do it. And so I think it was just us at Eric Hamber who they invited to try out. And it was basically six people from Eric Hamber kind of slotted into the normal Pickering boat is, if I remember correctly, kind of how it went. And that was our team. Yeah, it's really awesome that they decided to pull people from other teams because that really helps to develop people across the country, which is yeah. like the, uh, the idea behind the um, Team USA, like junior programs is to develop youth across the yeah. nation. Um, that's kind of how it was for me. It was just like, you know, PBA won the bid. I was actually also a new paddler that year um I'd been paddling a little bit before but like not competitively and like 2009 was my first competitive season with the Mm -hmm. PBA Utes um and so I had to try out as well and like kind of given the numbers and stuff like I like would have made it regardless because I don't think they would have had enough kids but at the same time like that really like was a kick in the pants for me like oh this is what dragon boating is at this high level yeah you can like really work for this and then like going to Prague and like racing against all the other u18 teams and like getting destroyed and then like watching the premieres for the first time race um and do really well especially the premier women's program that year um for the united states did really well that was all like so impactful to me as a young paddler so it's good that you know people in other countries are having similar experiences and like yeah that's now it was, yeah, definitely similar. Um, I think, yeah, I would have not really pushed as hard um, in paddling and gotten the benefits I have out of it if it wasn't for the people at Pickering inviting us out, you know. I, I'm ob- I've obviously been faster because I've gotten better at paddling, but I've never paddled more hours per week than I did like that. Basically, like my first real summer of paddling, I was doing like eight sessions a week. Um, I haven't really done that since. Um, and just, yeah, just that push um, of being, of trying to be good enough for something, like having the opportunity to try to be good enough for something. And then I think also the story of the two countries kind of lines up too, because by 2011, Canada had completely switched to the, system that I think is a little better where there isn't like there's a coach who's picked but it's not like the coach then picks their team and sprinkles some people in it's like there's that coach and then everyone across the country tries out that was 2011 and it was really nice for me that it lined up with being two years after that first experience of mine because then that gave me the ability to have an actual shot at um, trying out for premier um, and so that was great as well. Yeah, because you like your experience in Prague probably also gave you a lot of tools that helped you that following cycle for 
trying out. Yeah, yeah. Um, in Tampa, were you on U23 or were you on Premiere? I was on both. Oh, okay. um, so I, so I meet basically by like half a year after Prague, um, they'd started up like a formal U23 program in Vancouver. Just like it wasn't the, it wasn't like decided that it would be like the core of the national team program yet, but it ended up being. Um, so they started, um, I forget what it was called. It was like, it had a really bad name. And then eventually, like after like a long discussion in the doc, we came up with the name One West and that's where One West comes from. But um, yeah, uh, there was kind of this all comers program just in Vancouver right after that. And so I was deeply involved in that basically since soon after I left for college. Um, and so I, made a promise to that coach just because we were trying to like start a big new thing and I think we were successful and I think this was kind of the right call we were allowed to try out for premier but we were not allowed to race premier mixed and so um I raced only men's I turned down an offer for mixed um I kept true to my promise uh and then I ended up only being seated in the boat for uh, the sprints anyway. So I also raced um, the longer distances uh, for U23 men's in Prague. Cool. But even just the few races in Premier, that was a great experience. Yeah, especially as a young paddler too. Yeah, I think that was, that was something that was really great. Um, having that opportunity, uh, I remember I was like fresh out, it was like fresh out of high school, fresh out of Prague. And I asked the premier coach, um, she was the coach who'd been coaching us um, as like our only high performance coach in Vancouver. That's the high, uh, false creek high performance coach. And I asked her if I could try out for premier. She said, um, you're not going to make it, but I'll let you try. <laughs> and well, she let me try and she let me try and she selected me. Um, but <laughs> it, it was good that, you know, she, she let even very young people um, kind of show what they had without having any kind of proven pedigree. Yeah, I wonder if that would ever happen nowadays, like both in Canada and in the US. I th think that um, in Canada, the system has stayed pretty much the same since that 2011 year when it's been just very open, all comers, and it's like, whether or not you get into the program is really based on how you perform um, basically in time trials. So yeah, I think that would still happen um, in uh, Canada. I think there have been people who are as young as I was who have been on the team. Um, like I think someone off the Outer Harbor Warriors made it on the team at around the same age I did. Um, in the US, I think... I'm not gonna talk badly about the US system because uh, I think it has its own benefits, but I think part of it is that the level of competition actually that you're up against um, in the US makes it at least feel harder to break into because, you know, hopefully no one has their feelings hurt by this in California, uh, sorry, in Canada, but I think that no one on the premier team okay barring like two or three people no one on the premier team in canada would come anywhere close in a distance outrigger race to like the core of the west coast part of the premier team in the usa like they would just get absolutely demolished yet the canadian team is able in the actual dragon boat distances to beat the u.s team in a lot of events and so I think that, so the standard's very high in the US, but also the way that the team's assembled seems very intimidating because it's like, well, like this guy's a sponsored athlete. Like this guy has like a paddle named after him or like whatever, you know? It's like, there's no way that I'm gonna beat this person. So I'm not really gonna make the same, like people try out in the US, but I don't feel that they make the same all out effort that they would if they knew that there was a genuine chance of them making that team. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
I think one of the big hurdles is the Outrigger canoe, though, because yeah. that's so heavily weighted for premier time trials. And if you don't have experience and if you don't have access, you absolutely have no chance. I have to imagine with Canada, it's similar, but I've also heard a little bit about the premier selection criteria and it's not all outrigger canoe time trials it's other stuff too right yes well so it's changed since i've tried out um so when i tried out it was exclusively oc1 time trial basically and i guess like a little bit about your technique and so on which uh really determined if you made the boat like we had fitness testing but like thankfully for me like I think what the coach told me is, you know, because I was worried about this was, you know, we do the fitness testing, but the fitness testing is to keep the people without OC1 access over the winter competitive and engaged over the winter. And it's not really um, factored into things. I don't know if it's still not factored into things, but I'm kind of biased away from the fitness testing and away from the ERG test, even the ERG testing, because just because I'm personally someone who is quite, good actually at sprint but counterintuitively for someone who's good at sprint I mean like the 200 distance kind of thing I'm really not physically strong compared to most paddlers like I don't lift very much and in the years when I have lifted I wasn't very good at lifting like and that also like biases I think my erg results as well like I've never been able to keep up with people in short distances on the erg who I would be able to absolutely demolish on the water and so I kind of like that um OC1 waiting um at least in the if it's still around or how it kind of is in the U.S. but I think I can only get away with saying that without like the guilt of it just being like that's because like that's what I do because in my experience in Canada, like in pretty much all the cities, like OC1 was something that you had access to. Whereas in the US, yes, there's a lot of people who have that access, but that's because they have the financial stability to drop four to seven thousand dollars on a boat. And like I think that, you know, on one hand, in a physical sense, in terms of like the actual sport, OC1 is the most fair way to do those rankings um to select the team but it's definitely not fair to have one of the prerequisites to even like dream of trying out being to have four to seven thousand dollars in your bank account like that's ridiculous but that's kind of how it is at least here on the west coast Mm -hmm. i mean it's the same on the east coast too i mean i just got lucky that pdba had club boats because that's how i got my introduction into like learning how to train on the outrigger like even getting into one and like learning how to wholly recover yeah it's all because pdba knew that oc1 was important and the board decided to spend money on a bunch of oc1s that they still have and yet like even then there's people on team like me included who own our own and it's like so then you don't have to worry about like you know going down to the river to sign out a boat and like which boat's available and is it like a good boat or not Uh, because if you have your own you can go like wherever you want like whenever you want and it's so much like gives you so much more freedom and um ability to train um and that's only like our situation in Philadelphia whereas like in other clubs like there's other clubs that don't have club boats Mm -hmm. um and it's only like individual paddlers and then it's like well if you don't have an OC1 like do you get lucky and is someone like nice enough to let you use theirs and like how often do they let you use theirs and like it's a big like implication for someone to lend out their four to seven thousand dollar boat to someone yeah I think yeah, I'm just thinking back on, you know, when I was at my club um, and like the people who had boat, like boats of their own at my club back in Vancouver when I was in high school. And it's like, for me to have had that access to those private OC1s, it's also like, since I didn't have all that money, you know, I'd have had to like ask someone who owns a boat to lend their boat. 
but then it's like do you really want one of the prerequisites then to being a paddler having like 17 year olds make friends with 40 year olds like it's possible for that friendship to be healthy but that there's there's something that's kind of creepy for that to, to be part of the system you know yeah it's yeah like a connection that like is nice but also like shouldn't be necessary yeah like some some people who are like you know transitioning from like the high school or like early college programs in just like very locally on my side of the, the San Francisco Bay Area like it's been nice because it's like their high school team coaches are people who have been in paddling for a while have disposable incomes own one or more boats and like that's how some of those people have been able to be exposed but it's like that's a also a very it's like an unstable system right like if that one person per team who is both a coach and owns boats has to do something else in their life like the whole system collapses mm -hmm. yeah i know i think to to grow the sport um it's really necessary that at least some clubs adopt this model where you invest in individual boats that you loan out to your members. Um, I think that really is something that makes a big difference. Yeah, for sure. Um, I guess this question is kind of related to what we've been talking to talking about, but maybe you have another response to it. Mm -hmm. Something you want to see more of in paddling um, example, like more collaboration, cultural preservation, um, growth in the sport in certain areas, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think really um, the cultural preservation is something that I think we don't do enough of. And uh, I guess I wanna say, I wish that was my answer, um, but I think uh, I've been just kind of specifically focused on like the growing the competitiveness aspect so i really think that i just want to reiterate my point that we need to get these resources available to people not just the people with the means to pay to like make their it, it's not even efficient you know like my outrigger club has boat spaces for 200 boats um they're all full and the most, the highest number of boats I've ever seen on the water is 25. Hmm. So somewhere in that system, it's like, maybe instead of having only one eighth of your boats be used at the same time, at any one time, have a smaller number of individual boats that belong to the club and have all of those boats be out always. It's, you know, it, it sounds like a lot of money to uh for like a club to invest um to be buying like a fleet of 10 boats or whatever but if you think about it like versus everyone spending like six grand and then putting it on the rack for like 95 percent of the week you know it does kind of make economic sense but then i'm wondering like of all those people like the the 175 people that don't use their oc1s like how long has it been since those people have actually taken those boats out? And maybe there's some people that would be willing to sell their boats to the club for a reasonable price. I think that is how we've uh, acquired. So two of them we acquired because um, they got broken in shipping and we repaired them. And then I think a lot of the other club boats were kind of acquired in that fashion. But, you know, it's like, it's a big club. So it's not necessarily like there's a lot of boats on the rack that never get used. It's just like oh. at any given time you know like there's maybe like 75 active members of the club who have like a boat and like at any given time like uh only 20 like 10 to 25 of them are out i think the idea that i'm having is more like are there people among the people who have boats stored at the club who would have preferred to pay a little more for membership and then always had guaranteed access to a boat, which wasn't necessarily their boat. I think a lot of people who aren't like serious OC1 racers who want to like take their boat to like Southern California to race or like want to have the ultralight boat that they don't want anyone else to touch. I think a lot of people, they just want to have a boat available for practice all the time. And 
they don't really care whether or not that vote is shared. Like when I was in high school and in Vancouver, um, even a little after high school, I had no desire to buy my own boat because like, why would I do that? It's included in my dues. So, you know, I think that's a potential way to do it, which could kind of open up the sport more. I guess we can't advertise this widely because then the, the people who make the boats are going to get angry. <laughs> Well, um, if we want to talk about boat makers, we want to talk about equipment um, a little bit. I think, I think that's another problem in the sport um, that's made it less accessible. It's a lot of these boat makers pushing this idea that you need to have the absolute ri most ridiculous light construction and the absolute newest boat that's coming out every two years in order to be competitive. Um, I think there's some new boat makers uh, which would have potentially some good options um, for club boats too. Um, Are those? Uh, so I, well, the main option that I think would be very interesting as a club boat is um, Nello makes a ridiculous, it's so it's not good for surfing all conditions, but small chop and flat water, it's ridiculously fast. Um, and they make a nice heavy, um, I think, hybrid or fiberglass construction it's really heavy but it beats my ultralight pueo in the flat so and it's less expensive than the average zone boats isn't it yeah yeah it's like a 37 something like that no i was looking at buying oh, the new Kamanu boat right. and then i did the math and i can buy the nello at rear canoe plus a brand new nello c1 for the price of the Kamanu new OC one. I still want the new Kamanu OC one, but it's like, oh yeah, it's it's nice to see those options as well. Yeah. So I think you know some boat makers might be upset with the idea that uh, you know not everyone should get their own boat, but I think some of the newer boat makers who are making these more economical but fast boats might be really happy um if people started putting in orders of 10 of these boats and i think that maybe the relationship between the cost of boats and the barrier to entry um into the sport is very different in hawaii where like most of the boat makers are kind of based or at least originate and so maybe they're not they don't really perceive it because that's not what happens there like there's boats everywhere there people are very friendly about sharing boats there and some of the clubs i'm guessing i know that some of the clubs there also have club sets of these boats I think it's just, it's an effect that's gotten worse just because, um, because of this push towards like expensive ultralight constructions, but it's also on some level, like one that's always been there. I think I might have the history wrong, but my club in Vancouver, I believe actually purchased the mold for the boats that it owned as like the club set and had the boats made like it it also had that like the club back in the day also had that same problem with lack of availability of like good club boats so they just like kind of had a whole set made custom oh that's another way too then i guess yeah. if you have people that have those skills yeah what what else does the sport need i think that um really the sport needs more female coaches um i think it's at times just a very male dominated sport um i mean one thing is like i'm just thinking about like, the east harbor experience um right now where we just got like this really strong men's crew but even just like in a, just thinking about it selfishly like we aren't e able to like develop um strong uh strong female paddlers or retain strong female paddlers to the same degree just because you know we have like 10 coach type strong male role models on our team and like but the other thing is it's like my experience that I think was just really healthy in Vancouver which is very different from what I've seen um, really in the U.S. anywhere is that it wasn't even just like the men's team is coached by a strong man and the women's team is coached by a strong woman. Like when I was coming up through like the false Creek program, or even like 
after like the first coach, like the second coach of um, like one West, it's like you have the top one of the top or one of the top men's programs in the country being coached by like a woman. And like, it's not like that same gender division. It's like, I don't know. I'm, I'm not, I'm not being very articulate right now, but um, I think it just felt like a much healthier community um, like growing up in Vancouver where some of the top coaches were women versus kind of here in the US and the outrigger community and the dragon boat community where it's like at the top competitive level, all you see is men. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's like, that's a similar phenomenon to like, I was talking to a teacher about this yesterday. Like, why do we have diverse books? It's not for the diverse kids, like, like yeah. racial diverse yeah. kids or like um, gender diverse, yeah, whatever kind of identity diversity. It's for the kids who are a part of the majority and yeah. need to see people in that have identities that are different from theirs yeah. in positions of power, like in, you know, stories where they're having joyful experiences where they're the main character. I yeah. think it's the same thing with um, having female coaches, you like there needs to be visible women in power. Yeah. And I think that that's not even, and women. Yeah. That's not even just in terms of like for women to be empowered in the eyes of like the men. It's like there's just just it's an intangible benefit to the community as a whole that I'm having trouble articulating. It's just I feel it's weird and it's basically it's I feel it's weird and limiting to only have men be coaches mm -hmm. in a lot of like very subtle ways. Yeah. What do you think contributes to that phenomena of mostly men coaches? Cause it's not for a lack of women, female coaches um, for trying to go to those higher echelons of coaching. I think I think it just has a lot to do with, you know, if you're a paddler who's come up in a, like, a world, like, you know, uh, when I say a world, I mean, like, California is like a world, right? Like, where throughout your 10 years paddling, there have been no women head coaches of, like, any program, like, where you've never seen such a thing happen. Like maybe you have a woman coach the women's program, maybe you don't, um, but you've never seen like a woman or someone with any other identity than a man um, coach, like the entire program at, at whatever paddling center, then it, I think it's that idea, I, I can kind of come back to that idea um, with the competitiveness, right? you're not going to try to develop yourself to that level if you don't truly believe that it's a legitimate option that's available to you. Because like, even if like logically there's no reason um, why it's not a legit, like, like there's no one saying that you can't do it. And like, but that just knowing that there's no one saying you're not going to do it, I think is maybe not enough um, for a lot of people to really completely invest their lives into like making themselves into something if it's something that they've never seen evidence that it's possible and respected to do it it's like i feel you know the places where there are multiple really strong women coaches of top programs it's like it's geographically clustered which kind of makes me think it's like what people see in like a kind of an unintentional tradition you know because like it, there's like a cluster of that like in vancouver where that's happened and i think you know the portland programs do have some mm -hmm. but like portland is kind of its own world in the community yeah. and so that really doesn't spread outside of there mm -hmm. yeah one thing that i'm thinking of is both the role modeling of being a like a powerful coach um with like some other identity other than a cis male yeah and like kind of paralleling that to having just like role models in general for mm -hmm. people who are strong paddlers and aren't cis men yeah um thinking back to when i was a kid 
yeah. like me walking around like as a U18 or like a first cycle U24 and seeing mm-hmm. Megan Roberts walk around at yeah. the dock in Philadelphia like yeah. that for me when I was young and like impressionable yeah. um and a couple of years starting out that to me was like oh I can be like her when I grow up and like, I'm going to work toward that. Like it's possible and it's really cool. And now, and she's, I guess like back when I was a kid, she wasn't coaching, but she was coaching a dragon boat team. She's coaching POCC Mm -hmm. and um, she's now premier women's coach, which is really awesome to have someone who's both a really strong paddler, like accomplished and um, has a really great technical background be in that position. It's going to be, I'm, I'm very excited for this next cycle to see what yeah. she does. Um, we've been talking for a while yeah. and uh, I have two very quick questions, hopefully mm-hmm. for the end. Um, yeah. What is your favorite post paddling meal ever? Hmm. I think the one I'm really thinking of, um, what's really satisfying is just, there's a really good roast pork place, um, in San Francisco that I've really enjoyed a bunch of times after paddling. Um, and I guess that's extra good because it's so out of the way from where I paddle that like, by the time I get home with it, it tastes even better because I've been waiting for it for so long. Um, yeah, just something hearty and, and delicious mostly thinking about that roast pork so you're gonna go get roast pork then um well i'm in santa cruz right now so it's so oh, that's no, nowhere far. close so oh, unfortunately okay. no can't right. get that here all right um and then last question if you had one piece of advice for any young paddler what would it be i think it's especially if we're talking like the dragon boat world it's very easy to only see like what goes on and what's taught on your team. And that really doesn't allow you to grow as a paddler. So I think at a bare minimum, I want to say, get out there, go and like train with other teams, learn from other coaches. You're going to learn things that completely contradict um, what you learned for your X number of years on your team. Um, And, you know, a lot of teachings in coaching in paddling, it's not really what's true about how paddling works or how your body works. It's all kind of dogma that's been passed down through the years. And like people believe in religiously, but you'll hear something totally different from someone else. Um, And, you know, just learn all that stuff with an open mind. And then it's the piecing that together that's going to make you a really good athlete. And then if you want to take one step behind that, uh, one step past that, just as well as like trying different teams, try as many different crafts and like water sports as possible. You know, outrigger canoe, marathon canoe, surf ski, high kneel, if you can. Um, And if you have the access, like the weirdly, one of the things that really taught me a lot for paddling was I also spent two years rowing and, you know, my body type is not correct for that, but trying to keep up with like tall heavyweights um, and learning the intricacies of that um, did teach me a lot, um, both kind of just how boats work in general, and even the motions have more carryover than you'd think. So consider that as an option too. Yeah, just, Bob refers to rowing all the time at yeah. practice. Yeah. Because the what the blade's doing in the water is it, the mechanics are the same. The mechanics are the same. Even the back part of the rowing stroke when you're rowing sweep so like the single oar is remarkably similar to a paddling stroke as well the power phase with the legs obviously is not yeah but you do put a lot of muscle into that back part of the stroke too and i once took three months off paddling completely i was only rowing came back and did a time trial and I did very well just based off of rowing sweep like many times a week for uh three months so there's a lot you can learn from different disciplines and different people yeah just how to move a boat yeah cool well thank you so much Yohei 
Yeah, thank you for hosting this. Yeah.